do I really need to uh, sit through an entire lecture discussing these things? You know, that that's it's debatable. You know, some people can benefit benefit from that, and some people not so much. So the video is there for you, uh, but you probably more than any other video that I've uh, asked you to watch in this in this entire course. This is probably the one where you're able to kind of like fast forward your way through a little bit because there's some things where you know like for example a convenient sample i mean how much explanation am i going to provide for something like that you know so um so if that happened to be one of the things you sped through then then you're not gonna you won't be regretting that 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 one was actually pretty uh, pretty straightforward um but i wanted to take you through an example that involves you designing an experiment all right, so this one is, you know, it's uh, talking about the effectiveness of, a, for lack of a better uh, pain relieving medication, I went with the Vicodin, but it could have, it could have been really anything, All right? So uh, what we would want to do is design an experiment that would test the effectiveness of this drug uh, and the experimental units are the students in our class, All right? So that's, that's a little iffy to do. I, I used to do that in an actual in-class setting because it wasn't getting saved to YouTube and broadcast all over the internet. I'm a little hesitant to uh, to actually use the names of students in my class and, and then post it online. So I'll, I'll make a fictitious set of um, set of names here to work with. All right. So just to make it a little less awkward. Right? So let's say we have uh, Albert. One time I did this and I accidentally started naming off like half the students in the class just out of habit, but uh, Beth, Calvin, or Cal for short, you know, he prefers Cal. Um, uh, it, you know, I, I struggle with the names, you know, I'll just go with Dave, you know, Ed, Fred, if I get down to the T's, I might throw in a Ted, you know, just my own namesake. Uh, get a Greg in there. Um, let's go with Helena. Let's go with um, Ian. I'm going to go with Jan. I'm going to go with Clyde. Yeah. Uh, Finally. Uh, we can just go ahead and mute. That'd be great. Uh, I'll, I'll take care of that in a second. Lenny. No, I saw I saw cards and shit. Did you? Yeah, I saw yeah, cards. Or CBD. I saw the pen. This Did you? This cookie pen. Oh shit! Yeah. Oh shit! <laughs> now this place is gonna fall apart. So, what did you sell? Like, DA or CBD? Both. Both. Yeah. I sold I sold this D8 jar. What, what that one? Sorry, Two. folks. You're just gonna let the situation play itself out. No way. Walla. The D8 jar? Uh, no, sorry, the CBD jar. Oh, just CBD gummy. Yeah, this one. Oh, uh, sick. Oh, CBD gummies. Nice. Oh, oh shit. shit. My shit is up. Oh, yeah, it is. Uh, let's go with Manny. All right, so let's see how many people we got. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. 10, 11, 12, 13. Uh, I'll get up to like 15 and then we'll be good there. Uh, Nancy, uh, Ophelia, I think that's good enough. I mean, we could get up to 20. I could have also just labeled them A through, you know, whatever, just to make it, you know, a little bit quicker. But, you know, in, in an ideal world, you'd actually have actual people. So I'm trying to kind of, you know, give it a little bit of a sense of, you know, reality, you know. Of course, my the names that I picked up, you know, just just off the top of my head. So, um, you know that that kind of defeats the purpose a little bit. But you know, yeah, hopefully you get the idea. All right. So these are going to be the EUs, the experimental units, the individuals in the class. All right. So
All right. So normally I wouldn't take care of that first, but again, you know, like I said, because I won't actually be polling the individuals in this class, uh, I, I figured it would kind of make sense to get that out of the way. All right. So the first step in the process is going to be to identify the problem to be solved or a claim to be tested. All right. And so, and that would be specifically the explanatory and response variable. All right. Then we have to get into the factors that affect the response variable. That's the, that's probably the trickiest part. All right. Because that's, that's where you're not really sure um, if you're, you're accounting for all the different variables that could come into play. All right. So if you're looking at the, just the problem at, at first glance, it, it just seems to be a question of whether or not this medicine is going to be effective. All right. So that at least you can just get out of the way immediately. So is so the first step in the process is Vicodin effective? All right. So now that that's an important question because if it, it really matters how we define effective. All right. Okay. Thank you. I'll uh, I'll change attendance a little bit. All right. So is it effective in what removing all pain? Is it ref uh, is it effective in reducing it a little bit, a lot? You know, how are we going to quantify that? So that, that's part of the process, right? The explanatory variable The explanatory variable is really just going to be a question. I mean, a lot of this is really going to ask more questions than it's going to answer because, again, we're not actually conducting the study. So there's a lot of assumptions that we're going to make. But are we going to say Vicodin or no Vicodin? You know, I mean, do you give somebody a handful of Vicodin and say, okay, let me know how it turns out? Probably not. I, I would imagine that there's some sort of uh, dosing involved. So, Explanatory variable, amount of Vicodin, perhaps? And, and a possible amount could be zero. You didn't get any Vicodin, All right? So that, that gives you a wide variety of possibilities. All right? It gives you the freedom to say, well, you're not gonna get any, you're gonna get this number of milligrams, you're gonna get that number of milligrams, and have a graduated approach perhaps, all right? The response variable, that's I think gonna be the trickier part. All right, now again, this is all academic. This is all theoretical. This is all like, we're in stack class. Let's just be realistic about this, all right? So nobody's handing out Vicodin to anyone, all right? But, in this imaginary world where you're able to do that responsibly with all the different precautions that one would have to take for that sort of thing. If you were to give an individual who's experiencing the appropriate type of pain, we'll have to keep that in mind, Vicodin, what would we be looking for? So I, my viewpoint on this is that you, you have a couple of possibilities. One, it would be the amount of pain that they're in after they've taken the Vicodin compared to the amount of pain that they were in prior to taking the Vicodin. All right, that's one possibility. Uh, you could quantify that as just pain relief. All right, but I wouldn't be as simplistic as to say the amount of pain. Right? Amount of pain that that's very vague. Right, it's not it's not covering the basis. Right, because if you have a person, you know, like you're one going to assume that people are in significant enough pain to necessitate taking a narcotic, then you got to understand that th there's going to be some varying levels of pain, but they're all going to be on the, on the more extreme end. All right. So there's that part of it. But that being said, there's also pain tolerance. There's also the source of the pain. So if a person is at a level nine, 
you know, on a scale of uh, zero to 10, zero being no pain and 10 being all the pain, you know, then that in comparison to a, a, another person who's at a level eight, it could be, an, it could be apples and oranges, right? But if you compare the person to him or herself before you start comparing them to others, then you, you start getting into something that's a little bit more meaningful, right? So what we would be looking for is the change in pain, but just pain, uh, like change in pain, uh, like as in uh, the pain went from a sore throat to a toothache. No, it change in the amount of pain that the individual is in, right? Or the level of pain. Right. A smart word to include there would be intensity. Right. The chain, the change in the level of pain intensity. Right. So now we're talking about something a little bit more specific or a whole lot more specific, but also it still gives us the freedom to be able to pull people on an individual basis get a sense of their own pain tolerance, you know, because honestly, I, we all have our anecdotal situations, our, our stories where, you know, like you stubbed your toe and another person is complaining about a hangnail and you're like, what are you complaining about? I just, I just blasted my toe into like 18 different pieces, you know, like, what are you whining about? You know, everybody's got different pain tolerance. I mean, I, I still remember the time that I, uh, you know, not to be too grotesque here, but I bit a hole in my tongue. Yeah, you know, I was eating a salad. I was having a conversation with somebody. And honestly, I don't even know what happened, but I was about, I was going to say something. And there's a lesson to you. Don't talk with your mouth full. Like for whatever reason, I was going to say something while also chewing. The tongue got in the way and boom, popped the hole right in it. So a little bit of bleeding at first, more and more bleeding as time went on. I, I consider myself like a true tough guy because that was I'm a high school teacher during the day. So that was eighth period. And I had a ninth period class. I went up to the nurse's office. I'm like, uh, do you have any gauze? So they gave me some gauze. I shoved it in my mouth and taught my ninth period class. So like that, that's just the definition of toughness right there. So but I had to bag my night class that evening because four hours later, my, my tongue is still bleeding. So I go to the hospital, the ER, and I'm trying to have a conversation with the triage nurse, you know, telling her what the story is. They're like, what's the matter? The tongue is bleeding. You know, the blood is coming out of the tongue. You know, and she's like, all right, have a seat. And then like, it just, I'm sitting there, I'm, I'm bleeding all over my chin. And she, she calls the next person in. I'm like, and I'm looking at this person who's is, is like limping a little bit. I'm like, I think that person's got a sprained ankle. No, I'm bleeding out over here. I'm going in. Yeah. And so I, I can not say that because I'm bleeding out of my head. You know, so I was in such a, such a weird situation, but I did have a great story to tell because of it. And I'll tell you right now, the round of applause I got when they, when they put that needle in my tongue to stop the bleeding. The whole, the whole ER, Putnam Hospital Center, they all came over to see. They're like, oh, we had never seen that before. They all saw and they, they watched. And then afterwards, I got a round of applause from the whole ER. So, I mean, it, 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 it takes a lot, you know. But, uh, but yeah, the girl with the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the twisted ankle got treated before me. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe I just looked a little like I can handle it a little bit more. And, you know, her pain tolerance wasn't quite, quite the same. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, or possibly she was waiting there for three hours already. I don't know. But in my mind's eye, it was like, what are you kidding me? So pain intensity, obviously different for people, for different people, but the causes are different. So that would all have to be taken into account. All right. So we have to talk about the factors that would affect the response variable, all right? So the factors that affect the response variable. Now, I pretty much in, in that rambling in the last five minutes or so, kind of 
explained all that, but we want to explicitly state it. All right. So the factors that affect response cause of the pain. Pain tolerance. Anything you can think of, you know, you start, you, you go, you know, through your own experience and you start thinking of all the different, um, different possible things that could impact the response variable. Now on a test, I mean, we might not be dealing with a question that involves pain relieving medication. It could be something else, but you could bring your own, your own um, experiences into the mix here. I just asked you to come up with really at least two unique factors. So if you got cause of pain and pain tolerance, you're, you're good, but you can, you can throw in pretty much anything you can think of, right? Anything that would impact a person's um, level of pain intensity, like for example, other medication. Along those lines, any other ailments? I remember the first time, you know, like I, I had a dental procedure done. I took some Vicodin. The dentist asked, did it help? And I said, yes. My headache went away immediately, but it did absolutely nothing for the tooth. You know, so it is possible that it'll do something for you other than what its intended treatment is. Yeah, age, definitely. I remember uh, the first time, because I have that significant back problems. Uh, I, I, I'm, today, tonight's tonight. It, it's always when I, when I do this example, I go through the list of every single thing that's wrong with me. Not, not, a, not not for real, but you know, like it seems to come up. It's just a good way to explain the stuff in my experience. But um, but when I first started going to physical therapy, like way back, like a decade ago now, because I got disc herniations and stenosis up and down the spine, it's it's a treat. But I remember saying to the the physical therapist, I'm like, listen, the X-ray came back and it it showed fractures on my vertebrae. And, and, you know, like I, I had the MRI, it showed the disc herniations and all that stuff. And she said, oh, that's normal. Like, what do you mean that's normal? And she's like, no, once you turn 18, if, if, you, if you were to take an X-ray of anybody's spine, you know, or the vertebrae, you would, you would see fractures. And I'm like, really? Isn't that like horrific? And she's like, no, it's, it's normal. It's, a, it's the effect of gravity, right? It's the, the human body can only take so much. And so, you know, as you walk around over time, you know, and, and live life over the course of decades, it, it, the gravity is going to take its toll, you know, and, and anything you do on top of that is also going to take the toll, you know, so, you know, any kind of contact sports, you know, you know, all that stuff. So as you get older, you know, your body is going to be, uh, it's going to react differently than, uh, than when you're younger. So, you know, but we don't know in which way that's going to go. You know, maybe this particular ailment, you know, maybe a, an advanced age kind of lends itself to effectiveness of the pain relieving medication. Who knows? You know, that's why we experiment on these things. Right. Um, so, yeah. Anything, anything you can think of is going to be fair game as long as it's kind of along the lines of, you know, what, what the question's asking me, I suppose, uh, because I don't like to dismiss people's thoughts just because, you know, it's, it's not necessarily what I would have thought. You know, my first two, you saw it, my first two things, the, the two things that came to mind first were cause of pain and pain tolerance. Right. But then the other things start coming along, you know, you start getting into like physiology. Hey, a barometric pressure, 
I'll tell you right now, I, and I started collecting data on this every time, and it, it's and it's very incomplete. But what I what I did was every time I'd be sitting in the car driving to work, I'd be thinking to myself, I'm like, man, my back's killing me today. On those days, I would just say, Hey Siri, what's what's the barometric pressure? And she always says something weird, like, I can't tell you what the barometric pressure is, but it's 31 millibars or whatever it is. I'm like, why are you gonna be difficult? So, but it, it's always, it was always something in the in the low 30s. And you know, I I didn't I haven't created an exhaustive list to compare it to the days in which I wasn't experiencing, you know, that kind of level of pain that would, you know, prompt me to to ask the question. But you know, it's it's a form of data collection, but it was related to uh, barometric pressure. That's that's what I was thinking. I was like, I wonder if the pressure has something to do with it. You know, you can get into humidity, yeah, any atmospheric conditions. You know. Um, I, I know that um, that your mattress, for crying out loud, could have an impact. Like if you have back problems, you could have a, a, you know depending on the mattress that you sleep on, you could uh, you, you could have different levels of pain pre-existing because of that. You know, so all that stuff is fair game. You know, like I like I said, I don't dismiss it just because it wasn't my idea first. You know, um, but like I said, all you need is a minimum of two unique factors and you'll get full credit. It's just a matter of, you know, if you're actually conducting an experiment, you want to be thinking about every possible factor that could cause a change in that response variable. Because if you don't, then you, you, you create confounding in your study. Right? Any one of those factors that's not accounted for, that's not held constant, or at least under control, could become a lurking variable. You know, so I just always think to myself, when, you know, if I, and you saw the plant example, anytime I, 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 I put my plants outside, I mean, I did it a little too prematurely, my, the herbs, but, you know, I'm looking at it be like, all right, I know I got to water them. I know I got to give them sunlight and I know that it, it, the, the soil's got to be good, fertilizer, all that good stuff, but you know, like which, which one of them is going to have the most pronounced effect? Well, if I make sure that I give them the same amount of water and I give them the, uh, each, each of the plants the same type of so uh, fertilizer, the same type of soil, uh, then the only thing I wouldn't be able to control is how much sun is going to be out on a daily basis. Then I would know, okay, if they're, if they're not growing the way I want them to, maybe it's because I, there hasn't been enough sunlight. Uh, temperature also. You know, I went out, I put them out too early because I, I looked at the, uh, oh yeah, geez, shoes, absolutely. Yeah, if you walk a lot, absolutely. I got these uh, $27 pair of shoes from Amazon. I, 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 it's some no-name brand, never even heard of them. But I, I just looked on, on the reviews and it was like, find, find me something, even if it's only going to last for like six weeks, that'll be comfortable for just standing around, you know, as a teacher. And uh, so far, they're they're pretty solid. They're pretty good, you know. So yeah, you gotta have some good shoes. Um, but yeah, you gotta control these factors, otherwise the whole thing's done. All right. Now, determine the sample size. Like I said, I made up the the fictitious class set, so that's already accounted for. So what I'll do is I'll just kind of move that down below. And in uh, future years, I'll just or future semesters, years, semesters, and years. I'll just pretend that this was actually a list of students in a class. All right. Um, determine the level of the response variable, whether it's nominal, ordinal, interval, interval or ratio. All right. So the ratio level of data The ratio level allows for zero to be in the set. And when I say the set, I'm talking about the set of possible outcomes, you know, the sample space of outcomes. It allows for zero to be in the set, allows for data to be arranged in order.
and for meaningful differences. I'll clean this up in a second. All right, this is the one that you want. Honestly, if you're conducting an experiment and your, your response variable data is not at the ratio level, then you're probably looking at the wrong variable uh, or the wrong type of response variable. All right, this, this is generally the one we want. And so it's kind of um, along the lines of a, a trick question in the sense that if it really is an experiment, then, then it should be ratio, all right? Now, that being said, it won't always be an experiment. Sometimes it'll be an observational study, in which case we're not imposing a treatment. In this case, the treatment would be whether or not the individual is getting Vicodin, you know, and elaborating on that, the amount of Vicodin being the explanatory variable, all right? But if you're just conducting a study without imposing a treatment, then it would be an observational study. You could be looking at nominal data, you know, just the categorical data where you're talking about maybe, uh, you know, whether a person chose to go left or right when they pulled out of their driveway in the morning, you know, uh, uh, things like that, you know, something that's categorical in nature. Um, ordinal, where you only put the data values in some kind of order, but the, the differences between those values don't have any meaning. Uh, interval, being the case very similar to ratio, except you can't have zero in the set, all right? So in the case of, uh, of this problem, it actually makes sense for it to be at the ratio level because depending on how we define the change in, in pain intensity, it, it, there, there is room for zero to be in the set. I mean, a reasonable way to define it. So if we wanna measure the change in pain intensity we would do this by finding the difference or i'll just say find the difference in pain intensity before and after administration of the drug. All right, that would be at the ratio level. No, that didn't work. All right, with the idea being that if the result is zero, the difference in pain intensity before and after the administration of the drug, then that means that the person experienced no pain relief, no change in pain intensity, All right? So that, that seems to be reasonable, All right? Now, something that just kind of came to mind, time. Time after taking pill. Let's try to keep it simple, you know. You know, I guess the time, the time elapsed after uh, administration of the drug. But, you know, it's something that kind of pops to mind here is, you know, if we're finding difference in pain intensity before and after the administration of a drug, it's like, well, when? You know, when, when are we, we going to ask them? We're going to just wait for them to swallow and be like, how do you feel now? They're like, well, I just took it. Like, how do you think I feel? You know, so that, that's something to keep in mind. I mean, in terms of the pain intensity before they take the drug, maybe that's not as much of a variable at least uh, assuming that they're not
you know, they haven't already taken a pill, the second dose after a period of time, there's no indication that that's the case. Uh, but, but it is possible, I suppose. So you'd, you'd have to control for that as well. But assuming that this is the first time that they're taking this particular drug, it's not like they have any in their system already. So if they're, if they're experiencing pain an hour before, then it, in all likelihood, they're probably experiencing the same type of pain five minutes before. But you could also control that as well, you know, where you take the, the, the measurement of the, the amount of pain that they're in at a fixed time prior to the administration of the drug. 10 minutes before, 20 minutes before, or five minutes before, whatever you want, or at the administration of the drug, you know, like right before you do it. But there's also other psychological effects that come into play there, um, dopamine levels and things like that. So you got it's tricky, but that's beyond what we need to worry about here. Um, so collect your sample using randomization and replication. So now, now we need to actually randomize and and actually draw a sample from these individuals right and, and apply this like a treatment which is you know only it's only for an experiment because the treatment doesn't apply for an observational study and then the testing of the claim would only happen if you actually collected your data but that, that would be more of a theoretical thing but the the last part here is the part where you actually develop the entire study cohesively, but we do it in diagram form, right? So what we do is we say that we have our experimental units. They're getting broken up into whatever number of groups you decide upon. Based on the small number of individuals that we have here, I, I think two groups seems reasonable, right? So based on a simple random sample, We're gonna split them up into a control group and an experimental group. That control group, uh, we wanna we wanna establish a measurement for the placebo effect. Right? And that that's that placebo effect's kind of a weird thing. If you don't have any experience with that, it's really, it's really kind of, I would say, confusing if you just look at the definition and say, okay, well, you're just getting a sugar pill. Most people know that a placebo is, is some kind of fake medication. You know? But what, what it's trying to do is measure the, the response that a person would have if they were to think that they're taking a drug but not really taking a drug, right? The, the physical act of swallowing a pill that you think has medicine in it, we're, we're trying to measure that response so that we can compare that to the same physical act, the, the, the act of taking a pill, putting it in your mouth, being a sip of water, swallowing that pill, so you have that psychological component that affects a physio physiological response. But then on top of that, you also have whatever the effect is of the active ingredient in the medicine, right? So the placebo is designed to get a measurement of that placebo effect to establish that as the control, right? So, the example I have for this one, it's, it's, a, it's, I thought it, honestly, I thought it was a, a dated example, but uh, it, it's a case where, and it, I apologize if I said this in the video, but it's uh, when my wife was getting the, um, the allergy test, you know, skin allergies, they did that whole thing where they gave you the, the little injections up and down your arm, you know, and then in one, one of the injections, uh, I think it was on the back side of the arm. Um, <clears throat> one of the injections was just saline. That was supposed to be the control because who's allergic to tears? You know, uh, well, apparently my wife is, if you ever look at her face after she's crying, you see red streaks coming down her face, you know? So it's like, oh my God. 
you know, so you're allergic to everything. So yeah, her arm, you'd see like little, little bumps all the way up and down her arm. She's literally allergic to everything that they put in. Uh, but yeah, the control, <clears throat> it, it, that, that's, not, that's not a placebo. That's not a, measuring a psychological effect. Although I suppose it could be in the sense that, you know, sometimes people under stress can break out into hives. You know, I wonder, <laughs> now that I'm thinking about it, I wonder if it was a false positive in the sense that she was just so, so stressed out by the fact that she was having uh, like 30 needles put into her arms up and down both sides that she broke out into hives in those exact locations. I, you know, it's just a thought that I had. This is 20 years ago and this is the first time I'm thinking of that. But, uh, but that aside, that, that wouldn't be a case of the placebo effect. That wouldn't be the case of uh, administering a placebo. It's just a control, right? But in the case where perception and psychological response is prevalent, then, then a placebo needs to be put into place, right? So the control group will get a placebo here. The experimental group will get the Vicodin. Vicodin, I guess. All right, now we do have to assign the individuals to the different groups, but Somewhere along the lines here, we have to get a measurement of their level of pain, all right? So the control group will get the placebo, the experimental group will get the Vicodin, but the way that's gonna play out is you administer, oh, I'm sorry, we're not there yet, we measure pain intensity on a scale of zero to 10, zero to a thousand, zero to whatever you want, whatever you think makes sense, all right? So we'll say on a scale of zero to 10. And like I said before, this is none and this is most. All right, most being like the most possible pain that a person could be in. All right. I always love those, uh, those signs that you see at the hospital. The, you know, the ones that say, okay, well, you got the zero, the level zero, which is, they don't have the numbers, but the smiley face. And then on the other end of the, the spectrum is the individual with the crossed eyes and the tear and all that stuff. And it's like, I know that's supposed to be helpful, but I got to imagine that there's somebody looking at that being like, geez, I don't know. Am I the, am I the cross-eyed one with the tear or without the tear? I mean, I'm in pain, but am I, am I cross-eyed with tear pain or am I cross-eyed without tear pain? I, I don't know. What if I get this one wrong? You know, are they going to think I'm like, I'm dumb or something, you know, maybe I'm the only one that thinks that, but, uh, but I remember, I have had enough instances where I've taken too long to answer the question, where they're like, just, just, just use your best judgment. I'm like, it's not, it's not a multiple choice test. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm not taking an exam and I ran out of time here. Like, I, 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 I think this is important. I, I, I probably should get it right. You know, so, so what I do is I, instead of answering the question is I, I, I just describe what I'm feeling and let them tell me. I'm like, okay, so um, I kind of feel nauseous because of the pain and I want to pass out. Uh, so what, what would you categorize that as? Oh, a level, a, a level cross-eyed without the tear. Okay, put me down for a cross-eyed without the tear. That sounds good. You know, so that, that's usually the way I operate. Except, you know, when I have blood dripping down my chin because I bit a hole in my thumb. Funny add on to that story. Apparently, if you bite a hole in your tongue and you have to get a shot of epinephrine in it before you're, you know, released from the hospital, in order to demonstrate that uh, that you're good to go, you have to eat a turkey sandwich. I had no idea. They have, they have procedures for everything. All right. So you measure the pain intensity, but then you administer the drug. All right. So you administer the drug. I'm going to stay with the same color scheme. So administer the drug. 
uh, well, air quotes on drug, you know, so placebo. Well, I guess I don't need the quotes now, but. And then you administer the Vicodin. Then you measure that, all that stuff again. The pain intensity, zero to 10, zero being none. Let me just resize a little bit because I always run into this problem because I have no spatial intelligence. Actually, I have really great spatial intelligence. It's just not when it comes to taking notes. I think it's the, uh, the crutch of having the app that resizes everything. I apologize for that. But uh, yeah, so the control group is getting the placebo. The experimental group is getting the Vicodin. You're measuring the, uh, the intensity. Then you're administering both, depending on the group. And then you measure those values again. Then we find the difference. in pain intensity. So find the difference in pain intensity and then we compare. All right, we compare the two groups to one another. All right, that I, I don't think I need to resize, I can just move it over. I'll uh, bring it in again in a stack so that you can all have a better look at it. Oh, the parentheses are coming. I don't want that. Get over here. Okay. And then compare. All right, so I'll just kind of run it through again from left to right. So you have your experimental units. You break them apart into the two groups based off a simple random sample, which we'll do in a second. You're gonna break those two groups based off of the type of medication they're getting, or, or in this case, medication or lack thereof. The group that is the placebo group is gonna get eventually the placebo, but before you do that, you measure the pain intensity with zero being no pain. 10 being the most possible pain that a person can experience, uh, or at least that's how I designed it. But uh, you could say on a scale of zero to five, zero to 30, if you want, it doesn't make a difference, All right? Then you administer whatever needs to be administered, measure the pain again after a certain amount of time has elapsed, right? That's one of the factors that we listed above. Find the difference in the pain intensity between the two, uh, within each group and then compare between the two groups, All right? So a couple of things need to come into play come into play here. One is, again, we have to do the simple random sample to break our individuals into uh, different groups. But also, it would kind of defeat the whole purpose if we knew, or if the individuals knew that they were getting a placebo versus the actual drug, right? So in this case, what we would want to do is we would want to make it a blind study. All right. You might say it's a double blind study, but we didn't really get into how the how the drugs being administered and how the pain is being measured. Uh, the the idea is most likely that the pain is going to be measured by asking the individual, well, how do you feel? You know, um, but if it's a if it's a case where the person administering the medicine is also uh, going to assess the level of pain that a person is in, then you might make it double blind. Having the researcher give uh, labeled cups with the different pills in it, you know, uh, subject one gets this pill, subject two gets that pill, and then the person just walks around the clipboard and just making note, but that doesn't seem to make sense in this situation, All right? So this looks like a pretty well-structured study 
should draw some reasonable conclusions. The only thing is now we have to assign the individuals to different groups. Okay. So what we can do is use a random function in Desmos. Of course, why, why would it work? Why would it work when I need it? Uh, I'm just refreshing. That's a T, still a T. So if you type in random, you see how it goes. Um, I just drew a blank. Uh, italics to normal font. That's how you know it's a it's a defined function within Desmos. So, oh. um, teacher. This, I mean, I suppose we could use this. I was going to go with a random integer, but now that I'm thinking about it, let me see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Because, all right, well, let me just explain to you what we're going to do, and then uh, then I'll talk to you about how we do it, right? So what we're going to do is basically simulate the flipping of a coin, heads or tails, just using numerical value. All right. So what we would do is let even numbers represent. So we would leave heads and tails out of it because really it's even and odd, 50 50 split in the number system, in the real number system. We can let evens be the control group and odd be the experimental. So it really doesn't matter. Um, it really doesn't matter which function in Desmos you use, because as long as it just gives you a set of random numbers, you're actually fine, right? So, so we can actually work off of this because I can do the random, and just hit enter there and then just do it again. And it'll give me a fresh new set of right. The decimal point doesn't really amount to anything. Yeah, it, it, it's just kind of a weird moment for me because there, there are other type of random functions in Desmos that will give you random integers. But as long as we have the digits, it's perfectly fine. So we, we can just do it this way. And, and, it, and it takes a little less Desmos process memorization to do. So I, I think I think we'll do it this way. All right, so yeah, so all you do is you type in random and you see the open set of parentheses, all right? That's allowing for any, you know, whatever the, the maximum number of decimal places that Desmo is, is allowing, um, that will um, be populated with random, random digits, all right? And so all we're gonna do, and so what I'll in this case do is just write down the first, cause I have 15 values, I'll just write down the random digits that I see here, right? So my random digits. We got a nine, nine, zero, two, two, nine, four, two, two, nine, nine, two. Just gonna smidge it over a little bit because two. And so what do I have here? I got five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, right? So I just need three more. So I just go into the next computation and I get the three, three, four out of it. Okay. Right. So these are these are 15 values. And again, just using the random function on Desmos. So use random open parentheses on Desmos. Yeah, 
Yeah, like I said, I was going to show a different way of doing it, but I'm, I'm just thinking because I'm going to show you another randomization technique on Google Sheets in a little bit. I don't want to cross the wires too much here. All right. So anyway, what I would do is I would just go down the line here and assign each of these numbers to an individual. So if it's an even number, the person goes into the control group. And if it's an odd number, it goes, that, that person goes into the experimental group. So what I'll do, I'm just going to move everything down a little bit. Actually, Ophelia could have been over here the whole time. The whole time. All right, so my numbers are 9902. So these numbers get assigned to the individuals in order. So really what's happening is you got to kind of imagine that you have all of the subjects lined up. And what this is doing is simulating you flipping a coin for each one of them as they come up to you. You know, they're lined up. You flip a coin, heads, experimental group. Tails, control group, heads, experimental group, and so on, except we're doing it with the numbers uh, and we'll evaluate them in a second. So two, nine, four, two, two, nine, nine, two, three, three, four. All right. And so any even number, I'm just going to. Get my highlighter going here. Any even number is going to be in a control group or in the control group. So that would be Cal, Dave, Ed, Elena. Oh, sorry, Greg. Sorry, Greg. Ian, Lenny, and Ophelia. All right. So all those individuals are in the control group. All right. So I would just jot their names down. All right, and then everybody else would be in the experimental group because they're the odd numbers. So Albert, Beth, Fred, Jan, Clyde, Manny, and Nancy. All right, so all these individuals are in appropriate groups. Now they don't have to be precisely balanced, but they shouldn't be too far askew from one another. All right, so if one of them is overly populated in comparison to the other, then you would just simply run the simulation again until you got something a little bit more balanced. But if it's close, that's good enough, all right? So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight in one group and seven in the other group. It's actually one of the reasons why I chose an odd number of values so that we would have an imbalance just to really kind of emphasize how it really doesn't matter. All right. So as long as they're close to one another in size, you're good to go. All right. So applying the second, uh, the selected treatment that's already in the diagram, testing the claim, the best we can do is say what we would do if, sorry, spam, it's always spam. And um, the only thing we could do is say what we would do if we could do it. And that would be, we would measure the pain, we'd give the drug, we'd measure the pain again, find the difference and then compare the, the different results, all right? So that's actually the proper design of, a, of an experiment. Obviously a lot involved in it, but, um, but hopefully that that's, that's helpful for you. All right. So let me uh, let me actually stop that recording, and then we'll uh, we'll switch over and.